experts will have plenty to chew over during its three-day run. The event comes just a few days after North Korea's latest nuclear test. First held in 2012, the annual conference is modeled after the Asia Security Summit, better known as Shangri-La Dialogue, held every year in Singapore. The defense chiefs of South Korea and the United States have agreed to hold joint drills and bolster Washington's deployment of military assets on the Korean Peninsula. The matter was discussed over the phone on Tuesday between Seoul's Defense Ministers Hong Young Mu and Pentagon Chief James Mattis. Mattis reaffirmed Washington's commitment to the defense of South Korea and promised an effective and overwhelming response against possible attack from North Korea. The pair also agreed to ramp up diplomatic pressure to force Pyongyang to cease its provocations and Turn to dialogue. Now, the White House says it's focused on pursuing aggressive, diplomatic, and economic measures on North Korea, which do not include dialogue for the time being, at least. White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders said on Tuesday the priority of the Trump administration was on the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and the protection of American citizens. She added, Now is not the time to spend a lot of time trying to hold talks with the regime. Sanders reaffirmed President Trump's stance that all options remain on the table and urged other countries, including China and Russia, to help deter further provocations from Pyongyang. The United States and Russia have clashed at the UN Security Council over new sanctions on North Korea, following its most powerful nuclear test to date. Speaking to reporters at the UN headquarters on Tuesday, the Russian ambassador to the UN said he knows the US has drafted a new sanctions plan and explicitly said Moscow would study Washington's proposals, but stressed punitive measures alone will not resolve the crisis. I think it's a little, it's a little premature, so I don't think we'll be able to, to rush it so fast. However, the United States is insisting the toughest possible economic sanctions to punish the regime. The U.S. ambassador to the U.N. says Washington will present a new U.N. resolution by next Monday. Nikki Haley did not spell out what measures the U.S. is seeking, but her speech to a think tank in Washington on Tuesday suggests North Korea's oil supplies could be in the crosshairs. Do we think more sanctions are going to work on North Korea? Not necessarily. But what does it do? It cuts off the revenue that allows them to build ballistic missiles. Overall, international sanctions have done little to stop North Korea boosting its nuclear and missile capability over the years. Despite facing UN sanctions since 2006, North Korea's economy grew at its highest rate in 17 years in 2016. Time This year, the UN Security Council has met regarding the threats coming out of North Korea. According to U.S. Ambassador Nikki Haley, Kim Jong-un's actions cannot be seen as defensive. Kim Jong-un shows no such understanding. His abusive use of missiles and his nuclear threats show that he is begging for war. According to Haley, the U.S. does not want to go to war, but also cautions the country's patience is not unlimited. Here, she's alluding that the U.S. will defend itself when North Korea issues threats. With myth from the Washington Post points out that Pyongyang's actions have been clearly telegraphed. The author refers to a statement from the official Korean news agency. It said the Army's top missile unit was drafting a plan to create an enveloping fire around Guam. Well, the plan would be sent to Kim, who would then make a decision mid-month. And as you can see in these photos of Kim grinning ear to ear, the agency reported on August 15th that he went to see the missile unit's leaders to review the plan. And on the heels of the joint U.S.-South Korean military exercises on J August 21st, the news agency quoted Kim as saying he would keep an eye on, quote, the foolish and stupid Yankees. Seeing these annual exercises as a pretext for an invasion, Pyongyang fired intermediate-range ballistic missiles, allegedly capable of reaching Guam just two days before the end of the exercises. Well, the U.S. followed suit by way of sending another fighter jets and stealth planes on a bombing drill near South Korea's border with North Korea on the final days of the drills. And the article cites several warnings from Kim. On New Year's Eve, Kim said his rocket scientists were in the final stages preparing for a launch. This was carried out back on July 4th, and the U.S. is taking notice. On Sunday, U.S. Defense Secretary James Mattis said any threat to the United States or its territories will be met with a massive military response. It's a serious warning, but yet again, Pyongyang ignored such warnings before. In Washington, Natasha Sweets. The wording was more subtle, at least by North Korean standards, but the message was clear. North Korea's ambassador to the U.N., Han Dae-sung, said his country would send more gift packages to the U.S. if Washington continues to turn up the heat on the regime.
Speaking at a UN arms conference in Geneva on Tuesday, the envoy said he was proud of Pyongyang's latest nuclear test, saying it's a necessary deterrent against perceived signs of hostility from the U.S. The recent self-defense measures by my country, DPRK, a gift package addressed to none other than the U.S. The U.S. will receive more gift packages from my country as long as it rely on reckless provocations and fertile attempt to put, to put pressure on the DPRK. Han stood defiant despite the wave of condemnation and growing isolation being faced by the regime, saying pressure and sanctions would be a futile and wasted effort in deterring his country. He ruled out the possibility of any talks on North Korea's denuclearization, saying Pyongyang's nuclear deterrent is a topic that is off-limits and non-negotiable in any future dialogue. Washington's ambassador to the UN, Robert Wood, responded by saying the regime's nuclear and missile programs were a threat to the entire world. He said North Korea can no longer be allowed to continue its violation of international law and that it was time for the global community to put its foot down once and for all. Now is the time to say to the regime that provocations, threats and destabilizing actions will no longer be tolerated. Following North Korea's nuclear test, the UN Security Council held an emergency meeting on Monday to formulate a response. While Washington and its allies have called for a broadening of sanctions on the regime, China and Russia are still questioning the efficacy of such measures. To test its sixth and most powerful bomb to date. This, as new reports surface that the rogue nation is preparing for more missile tests and threatening to send, quote, gift packages to the U.S. So what options truly are on the table? Here to weigh in, retired Green Beret commander and former counterterrorism advisor to Vice President Cheney, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Waltz. Colonel, thanks for joining us this morning. You say thanks, there Pete. are, you know, there are three different, there are many different uh, avenues, but specifically you've got a diplomatic avenue, you've got a military avenue and economic avenues. What in particular in each one of those lanes can the U.S. do to prevent Kim Jong-un from getting exactly what he wants? Well, there's some things that we can do, I think, to change the Chinese calculus, and they are key here. And that'd be they the could, diplomatic side. And that'd be on the diplomatic side, that's right. Uh, you know, the Chinese are trying to have it both ways. On the one hand, they agree with us in public and they agree to sanctions, but on the other hand, you know, they don't really enforce the sanctions because they are afraid that if they choke North Korea off, uh, economically, that the regime will collapse, we'll have a unified peninsula that's friendly to the United States right on Chinese borders. So how do we change that calculus, both diplomatically and then eventually militarily, so that they see North Korea as more of a problem that it's worth and they take meaningful action? So you said, how, do you, yeah, how sure. do you squeeze China? Just briefly on that, I mean, yeah. what, what, what more can be done to bring them to that table? Well, militarily, a couple of things. One, South Korea has asked for tactical nukes for the United States to look at reintroducing tactical nuclear weapons back into the South Korean mm -hmm. peninsula. We had pulled them out under Bush Sr. Uh, and the South Korean defense minister recently asked for us to put those back in. Secondly, the Japanese are looking to to hugely modify and increase the, um, the lethality of its military, its constitution constrains, its post-World War II constitution, mm -hmm. constrains the Japanese from taking offensive military action. I think if we look at both of those things in a serious way, that will, that will in a big way, wake the Chinese up to where they look at a changing regional dynamic, its adversaries and its rivals, the South Koreans and the Japanese, backed by the United States, starting to step things up to where they look at continuing the status quo with North Korea as more of a problem than it's worth. And, and Colonel, I think it's only then will they start to take meaningful action. You mentioned the military side, TAC nukes uh, as a potential first strike capability or a response. Uh, we're doing a lot of military exercises in the region. Yeah. Is, that, is that effective as a show of force or is that only forcing Kim Jong-un to go faster so that he can sort of preempt our preemption? On the military you know, side. I think it's a response that we have to have and that we have to make to show our capability. But Pete, to be honest with you, we've been doing this for years, this kind of tit for tat and war games. But I think and, and I don't think that the North Koreans are going to respond to that. Who we need to respond are the Chinese. And if the mm. Chinese see Japan rearming in an offensive way and they see uh, tack nukes getting back into South Korea in ways that they seriously don't like, then that may change the calculus enough to where they take action against Kim Jong-un and sure. either force him to stop or force 
regime change in North Korea in Chinese terms so that that allays some of their fears but stops this march towards, uh, towards what could sure. be a horrible war on the peninsula. Uh, so you talked about the dim diplomatic and military options. Uh, the right. economic side is where you can really yep. put the squeeze to North Korea vis-a-vis Korea -vis China as well. Talk a little bit more about that. Well, we've started, we have just started, uh, and we being the Treasury Department, sanctioning Chinese entities and Russian entities, both banks and individuals and companies that are doing business with North Korea. We need to continue that. I think we need to expand it. And then we need to build an international coalition so that it's not just the United States sanctioning those international, uh, sanctioning those Chinese entities, but also Australia, Europe. Uh, Southeast Asian allies and others so that again now you have economic pain you have military and diplomatic threshold being raised against China to where all of those things combined force some change in their attitude towards North Korea because right now China is content with the status quo they really right. don't mind having a buffer state uh, and the collapse of the North Korean regime scares them more than all of those other factors Oh, great points we have no sane person wants a war if there were any other way, if someone can produce this magic formula at the last minute that will get North Korea to stand down, I am all for it. I would rather see my retirement investments drop than see bombs drop. But this is a, an, literally an existential issue for many Americans. And what I, my argument is simply this, that we cannot, to soothe politically correct consciences, consciences, allow large numbers of Americans to die. We cannot allow a regime that explicitly and repeatedly, indeed constantly, threatens to attack us, to devastate us, to turn America into an inferno. And we cannot allow that regime to have nuclear weapons that can be delivered to United States territory, period. They're not there yet, but they're closer and getting there clo faster than we thought they could. And so at some point, if it's a choice between dead North Koreans and dead Americans, I choose dead North Koreans. Well, you know, what's interesting here is that Russian President Vladimir Putin says that North Korea would rather eat grass than give up their nukes. Does that yeah. sound like there's room for negotiation to you? Well, Putin would have been better put, say that the regime wouldn't mind its people eating grass to preserve its nuke program. The people of North Korea have been starved and battered and incarcerated and killed. Uh, the regime doesn't care about the people. What they want doesn't matter at all. And then, by the way, they have eaten grass during various famines. But this regime, Putin's right when it comes to the regime, they, you know, they, they have now tied their survival to nuclear weapons. It's a, it's a much more brittle, uh, hollow regime than people realize. The vaunted North Korean military is not nearly as good as its numbers suggest. Even the idea that Seoul is a hostage that's going to be devastated in the opening minutes of a war is not necessarily so. So I think... What we need in Washington is a fresh look. Get away from the received wisdom, which isn't very wise at all. Focus on what matters, which is protecting our people. And Cheryl, look, this is really very simple when it comes to moral and ethical aspects. If someone is pointing a gun in your face, walking toward you and screaming, I'm going to kill you, you have the legal and ethical right to draw first and fire, or draw on him and fire and, and kill him. Okay. If someone is also aiming at your family, you have a moral responsibility to react. But right now, North Korea is aiming the gun in our face. They are, but certainly the stakes are much higher than a one-on-one -on -one gun battle. And even Condoleezza sure. Rice, former Secretary of State under G.W. Bush, said that the president, President Trump, is handling North Korea correctly. Listen to what she said. No American president can tolerate a somewhat unhinged North Korean leader, because if he's not crazy, he is reckless. And what the administration is trying to do, and I support what they're trying to do, is they're painting a very bleak picture for the Chinese. That's the only country with any real leverage. What the administration is saying to them is, your choice now is either we do something about the North Korean problem or you do something about the North Korean problem. And hopefully that will get through the Chinese, because the military solutions here are not very pretty. Okay, so is China the answer? Is China going to finally wake up and come to the table and realize that North Korea blown to bits is bad for the Chinese economy, bad for, for the Chinese people? Well, for China to crack down on North Korea, its only military ally would be a miracle on the order of the loaves and the fishes. And I think, you know, President Trump, to his credit, at first he was taken in by President Xi of China, but now he's realized that Xi was playing him.
that China is not helping. And indeed, Condoleezza Rice is right on every point. China is the only country that could possibly bring sufficient pressure on North Korea to stop it. But North Korea is their only ally, and they see us as China sees us as a long-term enemy. So we're asking them to help their help their enemy against their only ally. I have trouble believing it will happen, but we can. We can, we can always hope, but while we're hoping, we need to prepare to do what it takes to mm -hmm. devastate North Korea's nuclear capability. Well, you've got more than 20 in Hiroshima. What should we do now? Well, I think what we do is we go after North Korea's sponsors, Russia, but more important, China. And China right now is vulnerable. You know, their biggest banks, Bank of China, for instance, named in a 2016 U.N. report for devising and operating a money laundering scheme, that's a violation of our Patriot Act. What we could do is declare it a primary money laundering concern, and that would deny it access to dollars. Without dollars, it's not doing business outside of China. It's also not doing a lot of business inside China. It's a death sentence. You know, and it's and Bank of China, as big as it is, like the fourth biggest bank in the world by assets, is not the biggest Chinese bank that has been money laundering. So you know, this gives President Trump a really important point of leverage on the Chinese because he said, look, I can take your financial system down. If I take your financial system down, so goes your economy. If your economy goes down, there's probably no more political system with the Communist Party in it. And so this is a way to do this. Now, I'm not saying 100% it's going to work, but I'm also saying that war is catastrophic. And we have it is catastrophic, and we're talking about millions of people who could die in Seoul and in North Korea and in Japan and in Guam and eventually the western United States. That is not an option. So we have to talk about these unorthodox methods, and we also have to look at, because, you know, we have this real black and white way of seeing the world. And so China were just one thing, North Korea is just one thing, but there are those networks, there are banks, there are ways that obviously North Korea is getting materials it needs to build nuclear devices. It's getting missiles. It's, it's getting uh, nuclear and military reinforcements. That's coming from somewhere, and the somewhere is not necessarily the state actors, but these, these tunnels, if you will, these networks. Well, you know, there are a lot of Chinese companies that have been supplying things like uranium hexafluoride, which is semi-processed fissile material for their nuclear weapons program. We know that the, the transporter erectors, those big vehicles that bring North Korea's most important missiles to the launch sites, those are Chinese. And so, you know, that means that the Chinese military is behind this and so we've got to go after not only these entities that have been supplying North Korea with all this stuff but of course all the range of support that North Korea is getting from the Chinese yeah. from the Russians and from others we can do this you know John Bolton during the administration of George W Bush had his proliferation security initiative we need to reinvigorate that because we know the North Koreans sell this stuff to the Iranians to the Syrians each year it's estimated that Iran pays North Korea somewhere between two and three billion dollars for their various forms Forms of cooperation, which are missiles and also uh, nuclear weapons tech. So this is important for us to do. It's like the most important thing for us to do. No, it, it really is, and I, I think there are a number of ways of putting pressure here because, uh, you know, as I said, China doesn't want a war. And if they do a cost-benefit analysis, if they look at the economic impact uh, of, of sanctions and some of these uh, these punishments that we could put in place on them versus an all-out war, uh, because I, I understand China doesn't. Want to see a reunified no. Korean Peninsula with Seoul at the helm, which is, of course, an ally to the United States. But what is worse for China? That or, you know, having literally North Korea fall apart and, and millions pouring over their border? Yeah, long term, North Korea hurts China more than anything else. But in the short term, China gets a lot of benefit because every time North Korea does something belligerent, you know, fire off a missile, you know, we go to Beijing, we plead for their cooperation. We shouldn't be pleading for cooperation, we should be coercing them into cooperation. You know, we ran a goods and services trade deficit with China last year of $309.3 billion, according to the most recently revised figures. Well, that means we don't worry about trade friction because we're the trade deficit country. Also, we've got a much larger economy than China's, which means we can push them around. Our economy's not geared to selling things to China, but China's geared to selling things to us. And at the top of this, we've got a stable economy. China has one which is heading to a debt crisis. That's absolutely right. It's, it's very volatile, and uh, I, I think there are more people involved in these uh, diplomatic discussions who have
to acknowledge that China is in a pickle, that we've got them cornered right now, and there's no reason that we should be the ones spearheading a war where it's going to cost American lives, not to mention the millions of lives of those in the region. Yeah, and China can actually solve this because, you know, China accounts for like 90% of North Korea's trade. More than 90% of its oil is supplied for China, much of it on concessionary terms. But the most important thing that China supplies is confidence to regime elements. I'm not sure that Beijing could ever convince Kim Jong-un to give up his nukes, but what Beijing can do is those people who are around Kim that keep the regime together, China can signal to them that it no longer supports the yeah, nuclear weapons that, program. Yeah, and that they are safe. ...against Pyongyang. Let's take a listen to what they said. We've been clear about what our priorities are, that now is not the time for us to spend a lot of time focused on talking with North Korea, but putting all measures of pressure that we can, and we're going to continue through that process. Now, at this point, Washington is deploying more military forces to the Korean Peninsula. Uh, according to the U.S. Navy, more troops and military hardware are on their way. Furthermore, we've heard from a U.S. Army commander who says basically that, uh, that this is what uh, a response uh, to what he's calling uh, North Korea's uh, self-destructive actions. However, we're hearing quite a different tone from the leaders of South Korea. At this point, the leaders of South Korea say that they're open to dialogue and that there are two types of dialogue they are interested in having with Pyongyang. Uh, first of all, they want to have dialogue about the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and they want to have dialogue regarding the issue of, of uh, stopping any threats and provocations from the north. But the second type of dialogue they would like to have is a humanitarian dialogue about meeting people's needs and taking care of the humanitarian situation on the peninsula. Quite an interesting tone. However, we're hearing something quite different from U.S leaders. Now, it should be noted that Japan is also expressing uh, an interest in peace and cooperation. We've just heard that the Japanese prime minister hopes that North Korea could be pressured to change aggressive policies with consolidated international efforts, and that Tokyo hopes that strengthening mutual trust in Japan, in Japan and Russia relations will eventually result in the signing of a peace treaty. So we're hearing different calls for peace uh, throughout uh, Asia. We're hearing calls from, from China. China. We're hearing calls from Russia, from Japan, from the leaders of South Korea for dialogue. Uh, however, we are hearing this kind of talk of more military solutions, sending more troops and military hardware to South Korea coming from the United States. Now, South Korea and the USA are allies against North Korea, but they have very different tones when it comes to the Korea crisis. It's pretty clear, however, that if fighting were to break out, the people in South Korea have a lot more to lose than the folks in Washington, D.C. Work City RT's Caleb Open. Thank you. Well, Nazir Ahmed, a member of the UK's House of Lords, believes the US military presence in South Korea is proving counterproductive. I think uh, this is not going to help uh, uh, peace on the Korean Peninsula because there really needs to be a diplomatic solution. I think uh, President Putin is absolutely right and I think Chinese are also looking for a diplomatic uh, solution rather than uh, raising tension militarily. Uh, because the more we've seen in recent years, the more uh, military threats or uh, rhetoric that is coming out of Washington or South Korea, the response from the other side uh, is not getting any weaker at all. And, you know, there are limited options uh, that you can do. And uh, when you see a country like North Korea with nuclear weapons and also weapons cap capable of carrying these uh, uh, huge bombs, then I think that that people, uh, diplomats need to find a solution rather than military. The Russian president has said any further sanctions against North Korea over its nuclear program would prove useless. Vladimir Putin also warned that the ongoing escalation could trigger a, quote, global catastrophe. He was speaking to media at the annual BRICS summit in China, as Kate Partridge reports. It was a very comprehensive post-summit conference by President Putin. But, of course, one of those key points was about North Korea. And North Korea, he drew a parallel with countries like Libya and Iraq, where regime change had been opposed upon them. And he believes that the North Korean people are looking at that particular example and fear that threat of regime change being imposed upon them. And he thinks that is the reason why that they're hanging on and they don't want to give up their nuclear tests. Everyone remembers what happened. 
everyone remembers what happened to Iraq and Saddam Hussein. He stopped the production of weapons of mass destruction. Regardless, under the pretext of searching for those weapons, Saddam himself was destroyed, alongside his family members. And they remember that in North Korea. Do you think that just because of sanctions, North Korea will forget its policy of creating weapons of mass destruction? Russia condemns those North Korean actions. We think they are a provocation. North Koreans, as I told one of my colleagues yesterday, would rather eat grass than give up on their nuclear program, unless they feel safe. President Putin was pointing out that the U.S. response towards North Korea has been sanctions, and it seems lately as well, with yet more sanctions. But President Putin was at pains to point out that he feels that this is a dead-end approach. He doesn't back the nuclearization of the peninsula. In fact, he and President Xi of China have been very much against it, saying that it was unacceptable. But he believes that North Korea will carry on regardless. They want the militarization, they want the nuclearization of the peninsula, and therefore they'll carry on regardless of sanctions. So President Putin thinks that's therefore it's a waste of time. Time. He also finds it illogical whereby Russia and North Korea have been put on the same sanctions list before and therefore it didn't work and now the US is saying that they want Russia's help in trying to impose sanctions upon Pyongyang. It's absurd to put Russia on the same sanctions list alongside North Korea and then ask us to help impose sanctions against North Korea. The sanctions regime has hit a wall. It is not effective. But it is also to do with the humanitarian side of things. No matter what we do to North Korea, North Korea's actions will not change. But millions of people will suffer. President Putin reiterated his policy and that of President Xi as well in that they believe the only way forward is through diplomacy and get around the negotiating table once again.